Good morning. Today's announcements are for week beginning the 10th of December and the service you will be watching is from Sunday the 3rd of December which was the first Sunday of Advent. All our organisations will be meeting as usual this week and on Wednesday the Friendship Club will meet at 2.30pm in the lower hall. Next Sunday the 17th of December at 6.30 we will be having our Carls by Candlelight service. These are all the announcements. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to our service. Special welcome to any visitors here this evening. But everybody's welcome. On behalf of the older members of the congregation, I want to thank all who planned and worked for the Christmas dinner yesterday. We had a great time and I appreciate all the hard work that went into it. You'll find World Development Appeal envelopes in the pews there. Uh, please read through the information there and give if you can. You know how many disasters there have been in the world in the last year. They need greater than ever this year. The notice is hereby given that a meeting of the congregation will be held on Sunday the 10th of December immediately after the close of public worship, the morning service that is, when the appointment of new congregational trustees for church property will be made by the members of the congregation duly qualified to vote. What's that about? Well, our land and buildings have for many decades been held on behalf of the congregation by the Education Board of the Presbytery. That system is closing now and will be replaced by the Presbyterian Church in Ireland holding trustee company. So in other words, instead of every presbytery owning the, the land and buildings of the churches, it's going to be held centrally by this new company. They will, if we choose, hold the property on our behalf, acting only on the instruction of the Congregational Committee. Now, if anything's not clear, there'll be a bit more information at the meeting, but that's what it's about. It's a pretty formal matter, really, but we do need the approval of the Congregation. I'm sorry to have to announce <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry to have to announce the death of Mrs. Eileen Nellis. Please pray for her husband, Ernest, and all who will miss her. These are all the announcements. Thank you, Stephen. Good evening. Good evening. It's lovely to see you all. I'm going to do a wee bit of decorating around here or whatever and so can see you a wee bit better and get a wee bit closer to you. Uh, usually one of the things in your Presbyterian training they, they, they teach you you know how to structure a, a service of worship and the first thing that they ask you to do is a call to worship and it's usually you probably pick this up already I usually choose a verse or two from the Psalms to do that but I want to actually since we're coming to the Lord's table here tonight, I want us to read a passage from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. It's probably my favourite section of scripture. If we were a persecuted church here and we came knocking on the man's door to arrest the minister, and I had a moment to try and pull a page from my Bible, I think this would be it. And it's from Ephesians 1 verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he that is God the Father chose us in him that is Jesus his Son before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he, the Father, 
predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ to the in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace that's just phenomenal which he has freely given us in the one he loves in him that is Christ we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding and he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head even Christ and then Paul goes on in him we were also chosen having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will in order that we the apostles who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory and listen I am what Paul writes by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and you and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation having believed you were marked in him with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession and all for the praise and glory of God's holy name let's just take a moment to seek the Lord's face in prayer Father God as we come before you tonight come before the Lord's table we are in awe of the immensity of the plan that you've put in place to redeem the world we thank you from willing hearts to praise you the living one and so come Holy Spirit come anoint our voices and our hearts and join us as one in Christ Jesus that we may praise you in spirit and in truth through Christ your Son our Lord Amen so let's stand and worship God with hymn 304 your kingdom come the words will be on the screen
from me. Have you got anything? Yeah, because that screen's a wee bit off here tonight. It's a wee bit. I don't want anybody to take a nap with that big thing. That would be a disaster, wouldn't it? Let's pray. Jesus Christ, when I think upon your sacrifice, that you became nothing and poured yourself out to death, it makes us wonder at your gift of life. Father, we are drawn into that place once again to worship you, to praise you, to exalt your name to the highest place because you're the king of the heavens where one day all of us in Christ shall bow and marvel at your saving grace. Father, we have a great hope in our hearts. We've heard about that today, about the hope of the coming Lord Jesus. And yet, Lord God, we experience a tension within our hearts that, as Paul says, he longs to be with you and yet longs to fulfill the work that you've called him to do here on earth so that, so that all men and women might know you. Father, we come before you with humble and contrite hearts to make our confession to you that we have sinned against you and you alone. We know, Lord God, that our sins separate us from us and yet we know that you are a God full of grace and mercy and love beyond measure. You are the perfect Father. Jesus is our perfect brother and you have adopted us as sons and daughters into your royal, into the royal priesthood, into your royal household. And so Father, as the prodigal son was welcomed home, so you Open wide your arms to receive us as we confess our waywardness to you. Father, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Indeed, we have also sinned against you with those things that we have omitted to say when we should have those things that we should have done when the moment had arisen. Father, it's just a reflection as we confess these sins to you you before you and you alone. How full of grace you are. How full of love you are. For each and every one of us. So Lord God have mercy upon us. And assure us of your forgiveness. Through Christ your son. And help us to continue to honour you. Holy Spirit inspire us with thoughts that will. Honour the father. Give us words that will proclaim your kingdom and the light of your kingdom and the goodness of it to all those around us. And Father, inspire us to step out of our comfort zones with deeds which will proclaim the name of Jesus wherever we go. So Father, it's lovely to gather in this meeting house around the Lord's table once more. What a privilege that is. We praise you and thank you for that honour and privilege. 
And so as we did this morning, we raise our voices once more as one in those words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our first reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, please grab a Bible, as I would say, and get a double dose of the Word of God, not just through your ears, your lungs, uh, but through your eyes as well. We're going to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to read the first 13 verses, and this are words which warn, give a warning from the history of the nation of Israel, their their past deeds and what has happened. So let us hear the word of God. First Corinthians chapter 10 verses 1 to 13. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. That rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on the evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, People sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble. As some of them did, they were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. No temptation has seized you Accept what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Amen. And thanks be to God for his holy and inspired word. We need to read books here. Uh, please keep your Bibles open at that passage. We're going to read on from there later on. Uh, we're turning to him 316 Come and sing the Christmas and I don't know the next word. I'm going to find it in a wee minute. Uh, the Christmas story. It's up. On these ones anyway. So let's praise God.
ask uh, Robert, would you, and uh, I'm going to ask uh, Stephen, would you lift the collection? We're going to worship God now with the collection. I keep on forgetting to allocate two people to do this in the evening service. The collection will now be, the offering will now be received. is to gather before uh, the, the Lord's table and as it speaks of his sacrifice his offering of his own body we bring here our offering of money for the extension of your kingdom not just in this place but across the world and we ask that you would accept it in this beautiful name and as we turn to your word now we ask that you give us ears to hear and hearts to take in what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. once more to that chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 we're going to miss a few verses and we're going to go to verse 23 and read through to the end of verse 1 of chapter 11 so we've heard of some of the warnings from Israel's history now we're going to hear of the believers freedom the freedom that we've received in Christ so once more let us hear the word of God Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. Nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If some unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. But if anyone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it both for the sake of the man who told you for the for conscience sake the other man's conscience i mean not yours but why should my freedom be judged by another's conscience if i take part in the meal with thanks thankfulness why am i denounced because of something i thank god for so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the Church of God, even as I try to please everybody in every way. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Follow my example. As I follow the example 
of Christ. Amen. And thanks be to God for his holy and inspired word. Now you're probably wondering, boy, John, where on earth does that passage connect with us? I'll give you a wee example. Leslie and I, about a year after I gave my life to the Lord Jesus, 1996, 1997, Leslie and I found ourselves in Pakistan, of all places, in Pakistan to meet uh, a couple who were members of our church and their family, Peter and Anna Crawford, who were missionaries. And at that stage, they'd been missionaries in Pakistan for 18 years. And uh, the year prior to that, uh, uh, Peter and Anna had returned home because Peter's parents weren't well. They were very elderly. And uh, they thought they were, uh, Peter's father was going to pass on. And so he came home and he spent a bit of time at home with his family. And when they were there, they invited us round to their house after church one day. And uh, anyway, we did that. And I thought it was absolutely amazing that these people would want to spend time with us and our two boys who were wee reps and wee terrors at the time. But uh, they wanted to spend time with us. And uh, they headed back to Pakistan and I thought the conversation had gone that we, we realised that they'd been members of our church, sent by our church, they'd been out in Pakistan and I'd asked at that time had anybody been out to see them in the, seven, the 17 years, no one had been out to see them. Within a year they were back again because Peter's father had taken really ill again and in the meantime I'd come to faith and give my life to Jesus. And when we knew they were coming back, I said to Leslie, wouldn't it be really nice to invite them to our house? So they came round to our house to see our wee reps and tearaways again and to get their head turned over the dinner table. And uh, after the, the meeting, the, the meal, we're sitting in the living room and said, has nobody been out? Does, does anybody know what it's like out in Pakistan? And before I came out, you'll probably find I spout off times and I get myself into trouble. And I says, what would you think if we came out? And Anna's mouth dropped. And I thought it said something wrong. And she says, she said, would you? Would you? And that was us sort of hemmed in. And Leslie was going, do you realise what you've just said here? We have uh, two boys, uh, one was six and the other one was two and within nine months we were flying out to Pakistan for four weeks with a three-year-old and a seven-year-old. And when we think about it in the moment, it was absolutely mad, absolutely mad. But when we were out, Peter and Anna's house, there's a festival uh Muslim festival called the Eid al Adha, and it's like the old Jewish culture. It's a blood culture. See, people, we, we don't realize this in our community. When you go out in the Middle East, there's still a blood culture out there through Islam, and they quite literally, depending on your wealth, you took an animal. And it was a sign of obedience that you sacrificed the animal in the street with an imam to God to show your obedience. And we were out there and I went out the front of the place and there was a guy who had a bull. So you can imagine his wealth. And it was just in the street and the blood was poured out onto the ground and the animal was killed. And then they butchered the meat from the animal. Because Peter lived in that community, there were some of the meat arrived at the door for us to eat. See, now you know where I'm coming from in this story. It's not relevant today, as it was because my first question to Peter was, Peter, I can't eat that. It's been sacrificed. And you know something, Peter, Peter sat down, he was really, really good with me and he tried to explain things. And you know something, they all refrained from eating that meat because I didn't understand. 
what was in here. They all refrained because of my conscience was saying I should not eat that. I wonder what your conscience says about this table. With the bread and the wine. It's good to share communion. If you love Jesus in your heart. The Bible instructs us to remember all that Christ has done for us. Everyone ought to examine themselves, says 1 Corinthians 11, before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. The story is told of a certain African tribe that learned an ingenious way to capture some ducks in a river. And without a gun or a net, catching these agile and wary birds would be a feat in itself. So they formulated a plan. The tribesmen would go upstream. They would place large melons in the river and let them flow, slowly flow, float down into the flock of ducks. And at first, the cautious birds would warn each other. I could see this up in the Margie River as the, the ducks quacking away, and off they'd fly, sort of half run across the water at the same time, getting away. But the persistent tribesmen would subsequently float another melon into the regathered ducks. And again, they would scatter only to return after the strange spear had passed them by and again the hungry hunters would float another melon or two down the river. Time ducks, this time the ducks would remain with a, a cautious eye on the melon as it sailed by. And with each successive passing of the melons, the ducks would become more comfortable until they finally accepted the melons as just the normal part of life. And when the tribesmen observed that the melons no longer bothered the ducks, they would hollow the melons out, cut them in half, hollow them out, and put half of it over their heads. And they'd walk into the river, and they would meander into the midst of the tolerant flower, all, and they would simply grab them by the legs and go <laughs> dinner and their families would feast and roast duck I suppose the example of this is if we don't constantly guard or reorientate our hearts back onto Jesus it won't be long until we start tolerating the melons that are passing us by in life. And there's plenty of them there. Whether it's through these things here, or the books that we read, or the people that we hang out with, who are a bad influence in our lives. They have a seductive way of sneaking into certain areas of our lives. They creep in one by one until we sink beneath them and enter a watery grave and die. And in this chapter that we read, Paul used himself as an example of a mature Christian who disciplines himself in order to serve God better. And in these verses, he uses Israel as an example of immaturity by drawing attention to their overconfidence and their lack of self-discipline. Verses 1-5, the parallel for us here today is obvious. As God's people, we have been redeemed by, from the world identified as one in Christ Jesus and nourished by his spiritual food and drink. Indeed, everyone of us who will come to this table tonight has been baptized in Christ at some point of our lives, but these blessings are no guarantee that we will be successful. The cloud and the sea mentioned here refer to the exodus and the Israel's escape from slavery when God led them out, of, out by a cloud and brought them safely through the Red Sea. The miraculous spiritual food and drink he provided 
would sustain them for 40 years as they would journey through the desert until the promised land. And just as they were led out by God long ago, so we have been freed from bondage, the bondage and slavery to sin into a new way of life through Jesus' death and resurrection. God continues to provide for us through these elements of bread and wine set apart for holy use. We too are journeying through this world longing for the day when we arrive in God's promised land when Jesus returns to reign as our king. When God's people sinned, God disciplined them. God will do the same for us as people today. Verses 6 and 7, 11 and 14, 6 and 7 of chapter 10. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. And then verses 11 to 14. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfilment of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from immorality. Flee from immorality. Chris Wright says this, the worst things about idols as the Hebrew scriptures so tirelessly point out, is that they are utterly useless when you need them most. The incident referred in verse 7 is when the Israelites made a golden calf and worshipped them. The incident in verse 8 is recorded in Numbers 25, 1-9, when the God's people at that time worshipped Baal and engaged in sexual immorality with foreign women. The incident in verse 9 is when the Israelites grumbled and complained about the food God had provided for them with, for them uh, in Numbers 21. And the incident referred to in verse 10 refers to when the people complained to God against Moses and Aaron, their leaders, and God subsequently destroyed those who grumbled by sending an avenging, avenging angel into their camp in Numbers chapter 6. Exodus chapter 12. Today's pressures make it easy for us to forget or to ignore the lessons of the past or even for us to consider them irrelevant for today. I said this morning, I think during the service, that we are becoming so wishy-washy in our theology within the church it has been a decision quite recently within the Church of England within the last number of weeks to administer blessings on same-sex marriages, same-sex couples. I watched a, a vlog on YouTube just the other day of a, a young representative from one of the dioceses in the Church of England and he was, his, his delivery was unbelievable. But he quoted... What Satan said, he said, did God say? Did God say? And every time he gave his delivery before the Synod of the Church of England, every so often, the start of each paragraph, he commenced it with, did God say? We have friends, very good friends in the Church of Scotland. And they've gone down that path a number of years ago. 
they filled their churches, the doors would be open and people would be flooding through the church. It's the exact opposite. They're closing churches by the hundred. Did God say, we got to believe in God's word? Idols may not manifest themselves in exactly the same way for us today, but they are still present. We do well to guard our hearts. We may not make a golden calf with our hands today, but what about things like John's motorcycle? What about money? What about our jobs? What about our houses, our cars, even our children? We may not become tied into things like Baal worship, but I'm going to say, what about yoga? It's a physical, mental, and spiritual practice rooted in Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism. In fact, when Leslie was at school, there was a, an RE teacher who told her not to get involved in that because it is a means of evangelism for Hinduism. In fact, it's part yeah, of their evangelical outreach, drawing people in and allowing them to experience their worship practices. And regarding sexual immorality, what are your viewing practices with regard to television, to movies, to Netflix, the internet? You know, I can remember Leslie and I going to Guernsey and we went to the movie house in Guernsey. We were just newly married and we went to see a movie and I suppose in the, in the whole aspect of art and portraying things in reality, there was a rape scene in that. And I said, Lizzie, I can't watch that. And I got Lizzie up and I grabbed her by the hand. I said, I'm leaving. I don't, I, it feels really awkward. Everybody's going to look at us, but I didn't want to see that. Are you able to browse the internet comfortably with someone sitting beside you? Or do you maybe find yourself moving to hide the screen or turning an angle in some way? You know, we've got a really good friend. I sat with his friend over about six months. He was suicidal at one point. His wife was sitting in the same room as him having an affair with another man down the street. He walked out of the house because it was the right thing to do. He left his house. She inherited the house. He ended up in a week two up two down in a street in Korean. And what about grumbling and complaining? I'm really bad at this, Lord. We're all subject to it. It often creates a toxic work environment. It's soul-destroying, and yet we know the kingdom of God is all about winning and saving souls. I'll give you an example of this when I was in the police. Uh, we had the uh, whole restructure in the police, etc. Um, there was, uh, uh, I think it was Hugh Ord had the course for all. And it was all about restructuring the, the police service, and we were all sitting on, uh, you know, in our... And we were slating it left, right, and centre, or whatever. And, and then it came to the crunch, and people said, I'm not going on it. It was voluntary, voluntary to go on it. And I said, that's a free, out, free day out of the hotel. And it's free three days, actually, to Korean, and you get your lunch and all, and I'm going to go on that. Do you know what was transformative? It was absolutely brilliant. It was superb. And I came back and there were people all saying about, oh, you know, you, you gave in and all this here and, you know, we don't want all this change to happen. And I says, well, you're actually speaking from a place that you don't know what you're talking about. Go and make your decision after that. And we were sitting grumbling in our wee groups and it was really toxic. And we all ended up doing it. And do you know something that was absolutely superb?
Isn't it interesting to know that when God's people grumbled about Moses and Aaron, the end result was that God took these grumblers and motors out? Grumbling and complaining is one of the most destructive things that we can do because as words of discontentment and complaint are passed, they begin to grow and end up something even more unrecognisable from they first began. They end up as gossip and then the it, it changes, etc. Erwin Lutzer said this, Complaining about our lot in life might seem quite innocent in itself, but God takes it personally. Thomas Watson said, Our murmuring and complaining is the devil's music. C.H. Spurgeon sought to reorientate our hearts when he said, God's people may groan, but they may not grumble nor gossip. Ten minutes praying is better than a year's complaining. And Spurgeon was right. God longs for us to turn to him in all things. He wants us to reorientate, to refocus our hearts upon him and him alone. That is why there is hope in this Advent season, not just this Advent season, but Every day of life, there's hope for all of us, hope for the whole world in Christ, hope in this passage. It says, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. Now, he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. And when you are tempted, he will provide a way out. And so what is that way? Well, Francis Fenelon says this, to realise God's presence is the one sovereign remedy against temptation. The way out is seeking God's face. His presence, Emmanuel, God with us, and turning to him in prayer. Amen. Now we're going to sing, we're going to stand and sing hymn 424. There is a green hill far away. sort of saying in Stephen's ear here uh, as you were singing that last verse uh, I was asking them do we serve the congregation and you eat on your own and then we'll serve us as elders we're all going to hold the elements until we're all served so we can eat as one body and drink as one body in Christ Jesus so if, if you pop it in your mouth and it's just a natural thing that's alright don't be feeling bad about it 
Uh, but it's just to let you know. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the Lord's table. And so therefore all who possess, profess Jesus as their Saviour and Lord are welcome to this table. And you're invited to join with us around it to eat and drink in remembrance of him. I'm going to ask us to stand and affirm our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ through the words of the Apostles' Creed, which hopefully you'll have to look at one of the side ones. Sorry about this. You'll be turning this way and that way. Let's stand and profess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Here are the words of the institution of the Lord's Supper according to the Apostle Paul. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. It's my privilege this evening to announce that Sam and Ann Patterson are coming to the Lord's table here at Joymount for the first time by way of transfer. It's lovely to have you folks with us and a part of our church family here in Joymount. In this supper, God declares to us that our sins have been completely forgiven through one the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which he himself finished on the cross once and for all. He also declares to us that the Holy Spirit grafts us into Christ, who with his very body is now in heaven, at the right hand of the Father, where he wants us to worship him. Let us take a moment to draw near to God in prayer. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we come as you commanded all who love you, responding to your gracious invitation to share in this sacred meal, to eat bread and to drink wine in remembrance of you. We are here not just to receive bread and wine, but to celebrate everything that they symbolize. The breaking of your body, the shedding of your blood, your life poured out for us and for many, your death which sets us free from all that holds us captive. And so for the wonder of this meal, we thank you and praise you. And we are here to celebrate the many gifts your life and death have made possible. 
hope and despair, joy in our sorrow, peace in our confusion, light in our darkness, the gift of your love flowing into our hearts and out through our lives. We're here to receive your forgiveness, to rejoice again in your great mercy, your generous pardon, your unfeeling willingness to pick us up after yet another failure and offer us a break with the past, a new beginning, a fresh chapter in our history. Lord Jesus Christ, we come to this table in wonder and in awe, with joy in our hearts and a song upon our lips. But we come above all with gratitude and thanksgiving, recognizing once more all that you have done for us and responding again to all you so freely continue to give. And so for the wonder of this communion, through Christ your Son, our Lord, we thank you in his precious name. Amen. <coughs> According to the holy institution, example and command of our Lord Jesus Christ, and as a memorial of him, we do this. He, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. And said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do it in memory of me. Jesus said, come to me. All you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls.
take it, this is the body of Christ which is broken for you. This is the new covenant sealed by Christ's blood, which was shed that the sins of many may be forgiven. Drink from it, all of you. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. <coughs> All my, mo my inmost being, praise God's holy name. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. And forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all our sins and heals all our diseases. Redeems our life from the pit. And crowns us with love and compassion. Loving Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have fed us in the sacrament, united us with you, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet in the Father's eternal kingdom. So send us out now in the power of your Spirit 
to live and to work to your praise and honour and glory for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm going to worship God with a beautiful hymn. Uh, there is a Redeemer. I can remember when I lived in Green Island. I was part of a Methodist youth choir and this was one of the pieces that we practiced and practiced. And yes, that's how old this piece is. Uh, there is a Redeemer and the theology and the words are phenomenal. So let's worship God as we close our service this evening.